I must uh, now move on to questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. The Minister has given notice to the Business Committee that due to departmental business overseas, the Minister is not available for questions. And, uh, the Minister of Finance uh, and Personnel will therefore respond to questions on her behalf today, and, and uh, we thank the Minister for that. Can I inform members that uh, Question 7 has been withdrawn? And Mr. Alec Maskey is not in his place, so we move. And I call Mr. Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question two, the Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Member, for his question. I welcome the recent announcements of new routes, including ISAN and Lithuania. I am also very aware that the Deputy Minister is committed to improving Northern Ireland's air connectivity. The Minister has already met with the new Managing Director of Belfast International Airport. And she has also met with a number of airlines to explore opportunities for improving our air access position, and indeed met with a major airline. Uh, there is a meeting with a major airline during her recent visit to the United Arab Emirates. Deli officials are in regular dialogue with our airports and will support their route development endeavours by taking a Northern Ireland stand at the World Routes Conference in Chicago later this month. However, discussions about specific air routes and airlines are of a commercially sensitive and confidential nature. I call Mr. Lunn for a yes, thank you, and I thank the minister for his uh, answer so far. Would, would you agree with me that while the air routes that have been achieved are always welcome, but that uh, the, the ones that we have at the moment are inclined to take tourist money out of Northern Ireland rather than bring investment money in? And would it be beneficial? It would always be beneficial to the efforts of Invest NI if they had direct routes from the, the type of trade centres, such as the ones mentioned in the original question. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't, I don't disagree in terms of wanting to develop our routes into uh, particularly hub, airline, or her, hub airports across uh, mainland Europe. And, and the member has drawn attention to a couple of destinations in his question. And again, I don't disagree with the likes of uh, Berlin and uh, particularly, in fact, actually Germany as a whole would be a priority for the department, and, um, whether it be Berlin or Frankfurt or indeed other destinations. Um, efforts have been made as well. Um, the member, I'm sure, is aware uh, to try to get a route to Istanbul um, because of its strategic significance and where it's located. Um, I, don't, I don't entirely agree, though, uh, even though I do agree in some respects, I don't entirely agree that the two routes, um, the one into Reykjavik and the one into Vilnius, are not without commercial or tourist potential. Um, I think that they both have, perhaps in, in greater or lesser extent, um, tourism opportunities in both directions. Uh, but if you take Vilnius, for, for example, it is an area, the Baltic region is an area in which the uh, Invest Northern Ireland and the Minister have been trying to increase trade, certainly trade going into that area. Um, I think it was a trade mission last year or earlier this year uh, to the three Baltic states. So even though it may appear to be something which is perhaps even in marketing sometimes as a tourist route, there are business opportunities, particularly in that region. It's a growing area. It's an area with a... Um, yeah, huge opportunities for businesses in Northern Ireland. It's an area I visited myself and seen some of those opportunities even for local firms. So, their, their first impressions may be that they are focused on tourism. And of course, there are some some of the routes, particularly even those that have been um, brought on board this summer, which are out and out tourism routes or outward tourism routes. I think the two that are mentioned in the question are, are, are ones that do you actually have commercial and tourism opportunities attached to them? Mr. Patsy McLean. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, or Mr. Speaker, I should say now. Um, the, um, and thank the Minister for his response. Could the Minister give us some indication, and he possibly would have an overlap with both half cities contemporarily wearing, in regard to uh, air passenger duty, what discussions he has had with both the British Government and indeed with other executive colleagues in regard to the reduction of air passenger duty for short short haul flights? Well, Mayor, our, my, my position on, on, on our passenger duty, which would be a position that the Deputy Minister would, would share, is that it is a tax which is not of our making and one which we would like to see done away with. Uh, the source of the, the tax is obviously London, it's a Treasury, um, and I think there are ample studies and lots of evidence to show that, particularly for regions like, like Northern Ireland, which are peripheral, um, it has a detrimental impact 
uh, on the connectivity into those, uh, into those regions, and something which actually has been recognised by Treasury, who have given uh, some allowance for the, the highlands and, and islands in, in, in Scotland in terms of APD for short haul flights. That's something we would like to see as a minimum extended to Northern Ireland, but ideally would like to see the, the tax wiped out. Um, it has obviously gone, the executive pursued the power, got the power, and has reduced it to zero for long haul flights, but um, obviously we would like to see it done away with for short haul flights as well. There is a, an air connectivity study, which uh, my department and the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment are continuing to work on. It's very close to uh, its conclusion, uh, and that will hopefully identify some opportunities to improve Northern Ireland's air access. And, and we'll, of course, look at the question of APD, but we'll also look at other ways in which we can expand routes in and out of Northern Ireland, including um, better use of the um, uh, regional connectivity fund, uh, which is around, I think, £20 million, pounds, which uh, uh, the Chancellor announced in his recent budget. So I think sometimes there can be a fixation, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on APD as a sort of silver bullet to all of our connectivity problems. It certainly would be nice if it was done away with, but there are other factors as well. And sometimes selling the place and getting out and about in the way that the Minister is doing is as helpful as uh, I would argue reducing APD would be. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. I wanted to come in uh, um, sort of more in line with Trevor Lund's question. Do we have anyone who studies what we're good at here, like the diagnostics in health, to look at which countries we want to get into so that we then look at airlines to those countries to open up? Is that part of your co connectivity study? Well, I mean, the connectivity study, Deputy Speaker, will look at, at, a, at a range of factors. Um, and clearly trying to dovetail with our broader economic strategy is something that is quite important. Um, although getting an alignment, an exact alignment between what we are pursuing in terms of inward investment and what we are um, able to get in terms of routes isn't always easy. And to some extent, I mean, it's a commercial decision. It's not driven by us. So the airlines who have brought, the, say, the Iceland or the Lithuania route, they will have seen an opportunity in Northern Ireland um, we of course support that and welcome that, um, but it isn't necessarily a matter of us going out and being able to just say we want that one and we want that one. There are lots of ones that we would want more connectivity into North America, absolutely, something into the Middle East, definitely more into mainland Europe and particularly hub airports. And we will do we will concentrate all of our efforts in, in trying to do that. Beyond that, it is very much a decision I think for the airlines and the airports themselves. And of course, we shouldn't shouldn't forget the airports themselves have a route, and, and um, I'm sure I'll get an opportunity in the. Uh, not too distant future to, to meet the new managing director at the international airport. And I think there is an onus on the airport as well to, particularly with long haul flights now having APD reduced to zero, that's something that, that we have given them as, a, as a, an opportunity to go out and, and sell Northern Ireland. And they have a, they have a bit of work to do as well as um, Derry and, and very much in conjunction with Derry. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill O'Hashin. I'm pretty vast and Cory. Question number three, then, uh, question three. Deputy Speaker, the Deputy Minister will be meeting with the new Minister for Transport, Tourism and Sport, Pascal Donoghue, at TD, in the coming weeks, as soon as diaries permit. Uh, can I ask the Minister, has the Deputy Minister working with her southern counterpart on an integrated tourism strategy uh, and thus ending the process of the marketing of the two parts of this island as separate and competing entities? The, as, I, as I said in my original response, uh, Deputy Speaker, the Minister hasn't had a, a chance to meet face to face with the, um, the new Minister, the new Tourism Minister in the Irish Republic. I'm sure she'll, she'll take the opportunity as, as soon as she possibly can. I'm sure she'll want to discuss our, our range of issues around the subject of tourism. Um, although I do think that um, without wishing to speak for the Minister or preempt what she would discuss in that, for, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Minister's view would be very similar to my own uh, in the respect that it's, it's very important that. Whilst there may be opportunities, and there indeed there are opportunities through Tourism Ireland to work together with our counterparts in the Irish Republic to, to market the whole of Ireland as a place to, uh, for visitors to come to, there is a need for Northern Ireland as well to stand out and to have its own strategy for all arts and parts of the world in terms of attracting visitors to, to, uh, to Northern Ireland. Um, and in that respect, I'm, I'm sure whilst she want to learn from and work with um, her counterpart in a range of issues, I'm sure she will still want to have Northern Ireland pursuing its very, very much its own tourism strategy and trying to uh, sell the particular niche markets and specialities that we have in this part of the world. I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers today. 
In relation to cross-border tourism, can the Minister give us an update on the new British-Irish visa scheme? When it will be operational and what the benefits will be to Northern Ireland? Thank you, uh, thank you, Member, for his question, Deputy Speaker. I think this is something that I think is quite interesting, if not even quite exciting. Um, the Deputy Minister is, is fully aware that the British-Irish visa scheme will, will launch um, this autumn. Um, what I understand is happening is under the first phase of the scheme, Indian and Chinese nationals applying in their countries of origin uh, will be able to visit the UK and Ireland using one visa, uh, removing the need to apply for separate visas in each jurisdiction. I think the importance of that's, that's I think, transparently a, a, a good thing to have if it, if it removes any doubt from visitors from India or from China about where they go and when they can't go. I think it um, is a good thing. Uh, I think it's very, very good for Northern Ireland, particularly for those from India, from China, and I'm sure it will be expanded to other countries as well beyond that, um, to attract them. If they come in, their entry point is perhaps uh, the Irish Republic, say somewhere like Dublin. It will help in bringing them north of the border to um, could be trips to the causeway or perhaps even to, to Titanic Belfast. And of course, as we know, and I'm sure the minister said repeatedly from, from this position, that Titanic brand after Coca-Cola is the most recognised brand in the whole of China. So there are huge opportunities for Northern Ireland if there is increased uh, Chinese tourism, as indeed all indicators are that there will be. So anything that helps to get those people north of the border, if they indeed enter Ireland in the, in the south, is, is something I guess should be welcomed. Ms. Karen McEvitt. Well, Deputy Speaker, I was wondering uh, when the Minister now has plans uh, to meet Pascal uh, Donoghue um, in, the, in the very near future, I was wondering um, if she could put on the agenda the impact of the introduction of the um, road user levy uh, for heavy goods vehicles um, on the small and medium enterprise um, size location um, in and around the border areas. Look, I'm, I'm sure the Minister's officials will have, have heard that point being raised. Um, well, I suppose in some ways it's, it's first and foremost a transport policy issue, which would be one of Minister Donoghue's um, remits. Um, it does have an impact on the economy, and I'm sure the Minister in, in that capacity will be um, perhaps happy to, to raise it with her, or indeed one of his appropriate counterparts. Okay, and I call Katrina Ruan. Question number four, Kesh de Verkaher, Le Hall. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I understand that the uh, Deputy Minister met with representatives from Down District Council, including officials, in February of this year to discuss jobs and investment within the Down District. I know that the Minister found this meeting, which uh, covered a diverse range of issues, useful and informative. I do wish to assure you that the Minister and her officials are doing all that they can to promote new job opportunities in the area. In the last financial year, Invest Northern Ireland offered nearly £2.2 million of assistance to companies located in the Down District Council area. This assistance will help deliver total business investment of over 8.4 million into the area, promoting 255 new jobs. This assistance included, for example, jobs fund support towards Finnebrogue, the local artisan food manufacturer, to grow and develop with the aim of creating 65 new jobs in Downpatrick. Um, Ms. Ryan, for a supplementary. Well, as, as the Minister will know, and I'm sure uh, his Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment will know, that uh, in recent years, Down District has been blighted by continual erosion of public sector jobs. And I wonder, uh, would uh, the Minister outline what he and, indeed, uh, the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment plan to do in relation to public sector jobs? Because I understand the meeting didn't happen uh, that was requested in relation to that. I, I've met with, um, in fact, I, I was attended and spoke at a launch which uh, Down District had, Down District Council had in this building uh, in terms of a paper. I think Mr. Hazard actually sponsored that event. Um, and it, it was a, a document which was setting out the benefits for attracting public sector jobs to the Down District area and particularly highlighting the uh, public sector campus that is located at the old Downshire Hospital site in, in Down Patrick. And whilst I, I welcome that, uh, report. Um, I did say to them at that amount, and I would say again here, I think I actually said in the, the German debate that Mr. Hazard brought to this floor as well, that you know, Down District, like any area, should have more aspirations than just attracting public sector jobs to an area. Um, in terms of public sector jobs, the, minister will, or the member will be aware that her colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, has indicated her intent to move some public sector jobs um, to Downpatrick. There are actually, whenever you look at the figures, Deputy Speaker, 
more public sector jobs in the constituent or in the uh, down district area than there are in other parts of Northern Ireland. In fact, the average is about 31 per cent. In down district at the minute, I think it's 33 per cent. So it's slightly above average. Um, I think, the, like every area, the aspiration should be to increase the percentage of private sector jobs in the area and not rely on public sector jobs because whilst they're important, nonetheless, they are not the same driver of wealth and development the private sector jobs are. Mr Jim Wells. Uh, will the Minister join with me in the delight that we have one of the uh, top golf courses in the United Kingdom in, in Doyne Royal, and can he provide his assessment of the forthcoming arrival of the Irish Open to Royal County Down, which uh, many, many in this side of the House welcome strongly. Mr. Deputy Speaker, whenever he started off, I thought he was talking about our glass golf club, a uh, course that I used to play when I was young. In fact, in many respects, it ruined my game. Uh, of course, anybody who has played it will understand why. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's absolutely fantastic that the Irish Open is coming back, not just to Northern Ireland, but it is actually coming to, to Newcastle. Uh, I think Mr. Wells is absolutely right. It is recognised by not, you know, it would be one thing if it was us just extolling the virtues of Royal County Down or Royal Port Rush, but this is time in time out uh, internationally recognised as one of the best golf courses in the whole world. It's one of Tiger Woods' favourite courses. It's one that he always drops in and plays unannounced if he's in the um, in the shores on the shores. Um, I think that there are huge opportunities for particularly for Newcastle, which has developed tremendously well over the last number of years, the investment in the public realm scheme, attracting events such as the uh, Festival of Flight, which I was at in early August, um, has shown that Newcastle is more than capable of holding its own and holding major events. I think it will be a great host town and a great host course for the Irish Open next year. I think that the whole Mourne area will benefit considerably from having that event there, uh, and I think that there will be uh, if there isn't anybody who is interested in golf who already knows that it's a great course, I think after hosting the Irish Open there will be many more and they'll be flocking to uh, Newcastle to play on that course and other courses in the area. And of course we'll bring a, a, a huge economic boost at the time and I think that that will be one that will have a legacy and live for, for many years to come. And I call Mr Sean Rogers. Thanks the Minister for his answers thus far. What measures, ministers, do you plan to put in place, both in terms of public and private sector employment opportunities for disadvantaged areas? Well, of course, you know the, the, the minister's work and the strategy of her department is to, to try to bring investment into Northern Ireland globally. Um, we can't, um, whilst we, you know, we would like to see investment spread right across the country. Uh, I know it's a topic that is regularly debated. There's hardly a member. Uh, from their constituency doesn't want to see more investment in their areas, and particularly in the areas which have uh, high levels of unemployment and indeed in, in deprivation as well. Um, I think every effort will be made to show the wealth of opportunities that there are across Northern Ireland for investment. Um, it is sometimes very difficult to, uh, I understand, to get inward investment companies in particular to look um, to all, all parts of Northern Ireland for, for investment. Um, but it's something that I know that the, the minister is, is keen to see doing. I think if you look at the, I, I was actually pleasantly surprised in looking at the figures at, in Down District. Um, it's a, a district which, in part, I represent, um, and I was quite impressed with not just the investment that there has been in that area in terms of um, events and um, assisting our tourism economy, but also um, that investment that was hoped to reap around 250 new jobs in the last year through investments in the like of Finnebrogue and others. So there has been, I think, you know, considerable attempts, if not always appreciated attempts, to try to, um, if not attract inward investment into some of our, our more peripheral parts of Northern Ireland, but also, to, but more importantly, actually to try to grow indigenous companies who are um, um, embedded in those communities and will, will less likely leave from, leave from Northern Ireland or leave the area and actually create more opportunities for, for local people, whether they be in deprived areas or not. Well, Mr John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Minister's um, earlier replies to this. He, he has, of course, been driving to the point about um, private jobs. Would the Minister be aware that um, in Invest NI's contribution towards tourism businesses in South Down was under £40,000? Fermanagh South Tyrone has been £840,000, North Antrim £400,000. South Down, as the Minister will know, has some excellent products with the Bronte Homelands, the Moorns, the St Patrick Trail. How would he hope 
and how would he hope the department would uh, address this clear imbalance in monies going towards South Down? I think you can, take, you can take one area in which the department is funding and the member has taken uh, supporting tourism businesses. Now, there are already a considerable number of tourism businesses in the broad South Down constituency because of the nature of the constituency, a lot of well-established tourism businesses, whereas maybe some of the other areas that the member has men mentioned don't have the same level of development. Um, if you look at what the tourist board, if you take um, their support for events in the Down area in this year alone, um, they have supported the, the Bread Festival at the National Trust property at Castle Ward. Uh, £18,000 went to that. The Festival of Flight, which I mentioned before, very successful event, attracting over 100,000 people in Newcastle, had £30,000 of support from the Tourist Board. The Ballinahinch Harvest and Country Living Festival, which is in a couple of weekends' time, 18000 of investment. The uh, Slow and Chocolate and Fine Food Festival in Killalea, in, um, technically in Strangford, of course, or not technically, it is in Strangford, but in, this, in the Down District area getting £9,000. Um, everybody's encouraged to come to Killalea on uh, Saturday and Sunday for that. Uh, St Patrick's Festival uh, next year is due to get £30,000, and that doesn't count in the ongoing support that there will be for the likes of the uh, Irish Open as well. So that all adds up in a considerable amount of support for events in the area, which will obviously draw visitors, and there's lots of evidence of that. If you take the Festival of Flight as one good example of the, the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who came from all over Northern Ireland um, to Newcastle for that event, and then spent money in existing tourism businesses. So there, are, there might be one, the member has one particular narrow way of looking at it, which is direct support to the development of businesses. I think that that is perhaps a you know, almost arguably better way of supporting, but bringing, hosting events or supporting events that are going to bring floods of people into the area who will spend in the businesses that are there. So, you know, there are different ways of looking at it. I'm confident in looking at the figures that are there, that the Tourism Board and the Minister are doing all that they can to support tourism and tourism businesses in the, the South Down and Down District areas. Thank you. And I call Mr Paul Given. Thank you. Uh, question number five. Deputy Speaker, the Northern Ireland Tourism, or Tourist Board's International Events Fund for 2014 introduced a new model to support the development and sustainability of a number of events. The Ulster Grand Prix fitted the criteria to secure one to three year funding following a successful economic appraisal of an agreed business plan. As part of the three year funding, NITB commissioned an independent count and visitor attitude survey for the Ulster Grand Prix in 2014, and the results will be available in December of this year. Can I thank the, the Minister for that response, uh, and can I uh, again thank the Department for its continuing support for the Ulster Grand Prix? Uh, the fastest road race in the world, and uh, obviously to ensure its ongoing success, uh, to build upon a successful uh, year this summer. Uh, can the Minister um, indicate to the House that the Department will engage with the club and the other private sector investors who, who came on board this year uh, to put resources into the event to try and help uh, enhance the facilities to take it to the next stage to continue to improve what is a fantastic day? Mr. Speaker, I thank, thank the member for his question. I, I sort of realised, as he was asking me to do that, I could commit the, the economy minister to all sorts of things in this position, and she's not even in the country. Yet. But yes, given, given my other job, it the most responsible thing to do. Um, I, I, I think it, it, it is worth um, is worth putting on record uh, again, if it were needed, to said the importance of, of road racing to Northern Ireland, not just culturally and in a sporting way, but to to the economy as well. And sitting there beside uh, the member of Parliament for East London Derry, and he would remind me too of the importance of the North West and other events um, as well around Northern Ireland, including the excellent Ulster Grand Prix. Um, I, I, I think the Minister will be more than happy to engage on the basis that the, uh, Mr Given has outlined because of the, the previous success of the Ulster Grand Prix. And I've noted that in 2011 it attracted over 16,000 visitors, some of which were from outside of Northern Ireland, and it generated nearly a million pounds for the local economy. So, Something that is as successful as that and is ingrained in the, the culture of, of Northern Ireland is, is something that absolutely you would want to support. But um, like all such events, uh, I'm sure the Minister will want to appraise the results of this year um, and subject, I'm sure, to, to a business case. Um, and the availability of funds, of course, want to support the Ulster Grand Prix and, and, and indeed support other road racing events across Northern Ireland. 
Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? And can the Minister outline what discussions the Minister has planned with Mr. Donoghue's department and others towards supporting future bids for sporting events on an all-island basis? Again, I, I, mean, I, could, I could set the agenda for this meeting here, but this meeting hasn't, even been, hasn't even been put in the diary yet. Um, I, I know, I'm sure that one thing that the, uh, the two ministers <laughs> will discuss along those lines is the, the ongoing development of a bid for the 2023 Rugby World Cup. Uh, there's a lot of interest starting to develop around the next year's Rugby World Cup, and I think there's a, a huge opportunity for Ireland, both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, to um, capitalise on the growth and development of rugby right across Ireland um, by having a, bid, a successful bid for the 2023 World Cup. And I think that would be, have huge benefits for, for Northern Ireland uh, in particular. Uh, we've invested as an executive considerably, in particular, into Ravenhill, but also I think Casement Park is part of the bid too, and I think there's a, a ground in the northwest as well, which may, be, may form part of the bid. So this is something that is, um, has been agreed on by, by both governments in both jurisdictions, uh, and will, I'm sure, be something that, if not perhaps in the first meeting uh, agenda of the first meeting, will be something that the two ministers will be taking forward in conjunction with the sporting and decal minister as well. Thank you. And I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Yes, sir. Deputy Speaker, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership is a trade agreement that is currently being negotiated between the European Union and the United States of America. These negotiations do not constitute a devolved government matter. It is the responsibility of the Westminster Government to work with the European Commission and other member states to develop a comprehensive trade and investment agreement which reflects United Kingdom priorities. Thank you very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. The, the reason I raise this is because I saw a, a small document that had been handed out, I think, in the uh, Lords, and in it, it only indicated Northern Ireland as having one skill, which was aerospace, and yet we've got good health, good agri-food, construction, IT, high-tech, a whole mass of things going for us. It therefore seemed that we should be in some way trying to influence what is going on there if they only see us as having one high-level skill, and that's why I asked the question. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I mean, I'm not sure what the origin of the, or the status indeed of the, the document that the member is talking about, and perhaps he, if he could furnish uh, the department with uh, some details about that, they could, I'm sure, would be keen um, if we are being portrayed on a global stage as only having one skill. However, as the member says, rightly, we have many more than that. Um, they would want to try to write that and uh, correct that and make sure that a more accurate picture of what Northern Ireland has to offer is, is included in any documentation associated with the, the free trade agreement. I call Mr Phil Flanagan, the Vice Chair of the I, Free Trade. I thank the Minister for his answers, but I'm a, a bit startled that he thinks that the devolved institution should have no role in this, given that um, TTIP um, would um, or could devastate our agriculture industry by allowing foods of a reduced standard and, and GM foods um, into our economy, as well as opening up the possibility of privatising the NHS. So, does the Minister not think that, that such issues should be a matter of devolved ministers? And certainly, ministers here, if they are concerned about the NHS being privatised, and, and maybe your health minister isn't, um, but certainly they should be raising that with members of the, the British government and MEPs. There's, there's a difference, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in being interested in being in the lead on an issue. Um, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, as important as it is to Northern Ireland, is not involved in the taking a lead in respect of trade negotiations between the United States of America government and the European Commission. That has, of course, dealt at a, a much higher level than Detty would be at. Um, but it is important that there is an input. There is a regular input is had between um, Invest Northern Ireland through uh, the Chief Executive of Invest Northern Ireland, who meets on a regular basis with its counterpart part in UK trade and investment, uh, has kept appraised of developments that are going on. Um, and there is, of course, where there are concerns raised about the nature of any proposed free trade agreement, just as there will be, I'm sure, in across the other 28, 29, uh, or other 28 uh, member states of the European Union. Um, so too will they take me taken up with the officials in Brussels as well. In respect of some of the issues around, I mean, I'm sure the minister is acutely concerned about some of the issues that the member has raised, in particular respect about uh, the suggestion that is being made by some that um, the proposed agreement will lead to the privatisation of the health service uh, is being made very, very clear by 
Department of Business, uh, Innovations and Skills in London, who are in the lead at a national level in respect of this, that the commissioning of health services remains the domain of individual member states. And as a devolved region, it is at a further lower level down. So the involvement of the private sector in the delivery of health and social care in Northern Ireland will, is and will remain a matter for this Assembly to decide upon. That brings me to the end of the period for oral questions, and we now move on to the topic of questions, and I call Mr Fergal McKinney. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and, uh, in terms of the uh, potential in, in terms of numbers and quality, uh, would the Minister uh, care to reflect on the scale of our ambition? Uh, were uh, we to fully embrace the concept of Northern Ireland being a centre of excellence for cancer and uh, uh, cancer drug research and development? I, I do think, I think there is a, an increasing awareness that Northern Ireland is, uh, has huge potential in developing, um, I suppose, commercialising opportunities flowing from considerable public investment in cancer research down through the years. Uh, and as I understand, there are roughly 130 life science and connected health companies um, based in Northern Ireland, employing around 7,500 people, and they have an annual turnover of around, uh, in fact, over £800 million a year. So this is not, you know, as we sometimes think of life sciences in the broader sense of maybe being one or two big name companies, it's much broader than that, and it has a, uh, a wider impact on the local economy than perhaps we would, we would think. Um, the, there is um, obviously, the member has specifically talked about um, development in, in respect of, of cancer, and, and I do know that that is an area that the department, along with this department, along with the Department of Health, have engaged the matrix panel to undertake a, a, a foresight and strategy review for health and life sciences in order to determine how best to grow the, the overall sector, and included in that would be uh, in respect of um, cancer. Um, there was a the member would probably recall better than I will recall uh, an announcement um, last year of a £13 million partnership to accelerate cancer-focused drug, drug discovery in Northern Ireland, and that was between Queen's University and ALMAC, one of our leading life sciences uh, projects. And as part of this project, up to 60 ovarian cancer patients will be tried with a new locally developed drug. So I think there is a growing understanding and appreciation that it is an area which is as awful as cancer is, that there are opportunities in tackling that and a global fight in tackling that. Northern Ireland can play a role where we actually punch above our weight. And I call uh, Mr McKinney for a supplement. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his very positive approach to that. But in that context, would you agree with me that the Health Minister's approach to rejecting 40 cancer drugs that are available in England uh, and not making them available here could undermine that ambition? And in that context, would he, would he consider um, uh, reflecting to the executive the possibility of at least further um, and strengthened cross-departmental, if not a separate subcommittee of the executive, to look at this given the health outcomes and economic outcomes that could flow from such an important decision as making this a centre of excellence for, for the whole region? Mr Deputy Speaker, we are at the risk here of the Finance Minister answering dirty questions, but actually answering a question about the Health Department. We have sort of gone on a site of a very um, very circular journey on this. I don't think it's a, I don't, on the issue of what the health minister has and hasn't done. I don't think it's a matter of him rejecting the use of particular drugs. The, the member will be acutely aware of the financial constraints that the, the minister finds himself in, the difficulties that we have around meeting um, all of the demand, the huge demand right across the health service that there is, um, and the pressures that his budget is under. Pressures which are not helped by a lack of progress on, on welfare reform, which is denying him and the entire executive of much needed resources. Um, and I know that the, the minister has made it clear his desire to get a uh, cancer drugs fund um, established, or a uh, drugs fund established in Northern Ireland, and I, I support him in that endeavour. Look, I don't think there's any, there's any denial of the ability of Northern Ireland to play a leading role in, particularly in cancer research. We have already done that. I think we, we should um, uh, pay tribute to the likes of Almac and the work that they do in this field, and indeed other companies as well in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think it is, it is an area where there is huge scope for development, um, but a lot of work needs to be put in to support um, those companies who are already doing that work, but also, I think, importantly, to connect what we do in the public sector, in the NHS. Sometimes I think that, you know, allied maybe to the, the sort of scare story type stuff that Mr Flanagan came out about, about privatising 
the health service. There is nothing wrong, in my view, no matter what your view is about privatising the health service, there is nothing wrong, in my view, about using the opportunities that are there that have come from public investment to leverage in commercial opportunities that will create, create jobs on one hand, but also help to solve um, big problems around cancer and indeed other serious illnesses. And I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Can I ask the Minister, given the recently published PwC economic outlook, um, which painted a very bleak portrayal of a stagnant economic recovery, wages still below the level of inflation, um, what proposals debt he are bringing forward so that we can achieve a sustainable economic recovery? Cormac? I did, I did um, see the report and noted the, the, the report from, from PwC. Um, and I think it, one thing that stood out, and the members highlighted a, an element of it that stood out in certainly media coverage, which was of a, uh, I think, a patchy recovery was how it was described. And, and in some respects, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I've said that over the last year. I think we're in, in full recovery mode now. Um, however, there will still be elements of the economy which will uh, lag behind a little. Uh, certain sectors, retails one, constructions another, where I don't think you will see the same degree of, of growth or impetus behind growth as perhaps you will see in other sectors, including services and manufacturing sector, which have done, done quite well over the last year and indeed other years. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree with the assessment that there will be patchy elements to it, but I, in listening to that report and reading that report, listening to the coverage and reading the report, I don't think we should be dismissive of the tremendous progress that has been made over the last um, the last, particularly last 12 months. Unemployment in Northern Ireland fell by 1,400 in July, and that was the single biggest decrease in unemployment since October of 1999, so it was even well before uh, the current downturn. Whilst our unemployment rate is a little higher than the UK average, it's still considerably lower than our neighbours to, to the south. In terms of what, what Deddy is doing, in terms of the member mentioned uh, wages, and I'd hoped that we might have got on to the living wage question earlier, but Mr Maskey wasn't in his place. Deddy has been pursuing for the last number of years through Invest Northern Ireland a, a policy of pursuing companies which are paying well above the median um, average wage in, 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 Nor median wage in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that can be seen in the, the long list, almost a daily list of new companies that are investing here in Northern Ireland over the last couple of months. The vast, vast majority of those paying well in excess of the living wage and paying well above the median wage here in Northern Ireland as well. And as I think all of the houses agree. Um, the way we will tackle some of the underlying problems of poverty in our society is by ensuring that not only there are jobs, but there are well-paying jobs in our economy. Good for a supplement. Carl good for last call and I thank the Minister for his answer. However, given that at least 15 major reports since the 1957 Isles of Cuthbert report indicated that economic recovery will always be patchy uh, in this state, given our lack of controls on our own economic destiny, will the Minister offer his support for the devolution of necessary tools to allow us to carve out a sustainable and equitable economic recovery? Well, I, I, I do support the devolution of um, necessary tools. Uh, he and I might uh, disagree on what necessary ones are. Um, I have supported in the past uh, the devolution of uh, air passenger duty for long haul flights whenever it was a very clear need to do that in order to retain that direct connectivity into North America. And I still support the devolution of corporation tax powers to Northern Ireland. Now, I think we all know that, that will, when we get it, and I, I remain optimistic. Uh, that we will get it. We will await news uh, later in the week in terms of another part of the United Kingdom and what they decide to do. Um, but I remain optimistic, irrespective of the result there, that the power will be extended to Northern Ireland. And then it's a matter for us to decide what we do with it. It will be challenging when we get it. I think that that is the, the um, actually at this moment in time to the exclusion of all other possible tools, which I am not as convinced would have the transformative effect for our economy that corporation tax would have. That is the one that, that I remain focused on. It's the one that the Deddy Minister remain focuses, remains focused on. It's the power that the executive as a whole remains focused on. And I think if we get it and we take the decision to reduce corporation tax in Northern Ireland to a lower level, then I think it will have that, that effect. While it's not being a silver bullet for our economy, it will have a transformative effect in a way that no other tax raising or varying power could have for the Northern Ireland economy. Um, I call Mr Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. With the ongoing conflict in the Ukraine uh, with Russians, it, it may seem a little bit far off, but given our reliance on gas, surely it must be of concern to us all. So would the Minister advise what action is being taken to ensure that we have diversity in our electricity generating capacity and to ensure that we are not enabling excessive profits to be made by those generators? 
Yeah. The, the member is the member is perhaps right to characterise it as something that seems remote and distant to, to the activities in this house. But whenever um, uh, civil unrest or um, crisis or in eastern Ukraine does impact on um, does happen, it does have an impact um, further afield. Um, it does have particularly in the members' right to highlight the impact that it could potentially have on gas supplies with so many gas, uh, natural gas supplies coming for, for Europe coming from Russia and going through Ukraine. And I think as I understand most of the UK supply of natural gas that isn't our own comes from either liquefied natural gas or from Norway. But of course those ships can be diverted mid-sea to go to other places where it is needed or, or a higher price is paid. Um, so you know, this is something that we, we should be aware of. It isn't perhaps seen as sometimes in this place as pressing a matter as it is, but that's one reason why the Deputy Minister and lead others, uh, myself included within the executive, have long talked about this as an issue of security of supply rather than one of primarily of prices perhaps. It is something that we need to um, continue to focus on achieving our program for government targets in terms of diversification of our um, energy sources and I, I note too that we are on track to reach our 20 per cent target in terms of uh, renewables. Um, I think also we have got the press ahead with improving our, our infrastructure and that includes uh, the north-south in interconnector um, which will ensure that Northern Ireland's electricity supply um, can benefit from having that better connectivity to the Irish Republic. Thank you. And I call Mr Biggs for a supplement. The, the latest uh, power station proposal uh, in Northern Ireland has been a sizeable uh, power station in the scenic Ember area outside Larne, uh, which initially was being floated in terms of uh, renewable energy storage. But I've noticed that it requires a, a high pressure gas supply and so is heavily dependent on gas in the future as well. Can the Minister, and perhaps using his, his uh, DFP background as well as standing in here for, for Deputy, can he assure me that no public funding will be used to, to uh, create yet another power station that will be dependent on gas, which uh, future is unsecure? Mr. I, I don't know enough about the particular. Um, potential power station to pass any definitive comment on it, and I would be cautious about doing that either on my own behalf or on behalf of the uh, Deputy Minister either. Um, so I'll refrain from, from, from passing a particular comment on it. I'm not sure the status of, of that proposal and whether indeed it is actually applied for public money, um, but certainly you know, I'm happy. I'm, I'm sure officials will have heard the member raise an aquarium, and I'll ensure that they write back to him a little bit more detail around that. Ian, comes to Sean Lynn. And I understand that the Minister is standing in for his colleague, but however, can I ask them uh, to provide details on strategies that exist to address underemployment, given that a report from the TUC has shown that locally we have experienced the sharpest increase in underemployment, an increase of 37 per cent since 2010? But, I'm, I'm not aware, and I can certainly furnish the member with any specific elements of existing strategies or specific strategies that deal with the issue of, of underemployment. Uh, and I'm, all, what I can say is I'm, I'm aware that you know, sometimes we focus on unemployment as a problem or elements of unemployment, like youth employment as a problem, uh, and they are problems, and, and I think we are making significant progress in terms of addressing underemployment and indeed making slow progress in addressing, uh, slow but positive progress in addressing economic inactivity in Northern Ireland, but we, we mustn't forget that there are many people who, whilst they're in work, are defined as underemployed in terms of the hours that they're doing or uh, the type of job that they're performing. And you know, I think that um, I'm sure that what will come back from the department is that much of what we are doing in trying to attract investment into Northern Ireland, trying to grow indigenous firms, is all aimed at ensuring that whether it's unemployment, youth unemployment or underemployment, that we are strengthening our economy and creating opportunities for everyone. Lynch for a quick supplementary. and uh, I want to thank the Minister for his answer. And as Finance Minister, he'll be aware as, as the squeeze goes on, on pay, more and more people become, uh, become more poor and living in poverty. Can he provide assurances that Deti will deliver more permanent jobs? Otherwise, we'll continue to experience increased uh, emigration, underemployment, and growth in food banks. 
I think over the last, I mentioned in response to Mr. Hazard's question about um, the significant reduction that there has been on unemployment, it's still, there are still issues, um, still higher than UK average, significantly lower, yes, than EU average and uh, figures in the Republic of Ireland, but they're still higher than we would like. We need to see further progress, we need to see more bearing down on, we need to see addressing issues like uh, youth unemployment. But in terms of creating permanent jobs in Northern Ireland, the, the member would need only go back and look at the Deddy website and the news pages over the number of jobs that has been, have been supported. And these are the only the ones that have been supported by Invest Northern Ireland over the last number of weeks. 31 jobs announced yes, yesterday in um, Smiley Munro and Lisburn, 22. And these are just in the month of September in Deluxe Group in Portadown, 35 at Webtech and Enniskillen in the members' own constituency, 47 in Magellan Aerospace in my own constituency in, in Grey Abbey, 338 jobs uh, at Deloitte in Belfast, and it could go on and on and on. And that's just and Baker McKenzie, Almack, nearly 350 capital, 400 jobs. There have been small, medium, and large size investments supported by Invest Northern Ireland over the last six months which have amounted to a huge number of new jobs, permanent new jobs coming into Northern Ireland. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think these are things that we should, on every side of this House, be welcoming. Thank you. And, uh, time is up. I thank the Minister for standing in so capably for his colleague. And before